me, it's looking at, you know, the Torah covers everything for us. Shulchan Aruch covers every subject under the sun, and yet there's glaringly omitted a sugya, a chelik, on chinuch habonim. It's fascinating. Where do we find it? The answer, the poshid answer, I think, is because you find it everywhere. The entire Torah is chinuch habonim. You can't possibly have just a small section on chinuch habonim. If everything is about chinuch habonim, it's about bringing up children, you service the Torah to live a life of Torah and mitzvahs. So the whole thing is really parenting. But I'd like to highlight one particular point that perhaps we can draw something, I hope, crucial, yesidistic, clolistic about parenting, and uh, we'll extrapolate it from the Torah and bring it down the Maisa. And then we're going to try and do all this in about 30 minutes or so. We'll see if we must live. So the uh, it, most obvious sugya of parenting in the Torah is the sugya of Ben Sora Vemora. You know, that's the sugya, where we, uh, the Torah instructs us and guides us how we should be mechanech. So the Pasuk says like this in Devarim, Ki yeh le'ish ben tzayre v'moira, you have a rebellious child, e'neinu shomea b'kol oviv b'kol imay. Doesn't listen to his parents, I think a lot of people can relate to this today, he doesn't listen to his parents. V'yisro so, they punish him, v'lo yishma le'em, that doesn't work either. I get these shailas every day. We punish, we try, it doesn't work, what do we do next? So the Torah, in its chachma, wisdom and compassion, describes what we should do. His parents, his father and mother take him, they take him out to the Zkenim, to the gates of the city. He doesn't listen to us, just eats and drinks, has fun. What do we do? And they stone him to death. It's one parenting mahalach, I guess. They stone him to death. And we get rid of this evil, and all Kalisol should listen. You know, in the fantasy, sometimes in the back of the head, we think it's not a bad idea. But Maisa, what is the Torah teaching us? So this story of Ben Sora Vemoira, when we expand upon it, is actually amazingly yesidistic, fascinating, and insightful, and lemaisa about our lives. Even though we're going to see in a moment, uh, one Tana, maybe two Tanaim, who say it never happened. <coughs> it never was. But let's see what the Gemara says. So the Gemara, the Mishnah says like this, I just want to be Mazbe, and then you'll see where I'm going with this. Zog the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. Hoya aviv reitza ve'ima eina reitza. Let's say the father got fed up, and he decided, that's it. He's not listening to us. We've got to take him to the, the gates of the city. We've got to stone him. But the mother doesn't want. Aviv eina reitza ve'ima reitza. Let's say the father doesn't want. The mother does want. Eina nasa ben sarvimer ad shushneim reitza. They both have to be wanting this to happen. Otherwise, there's no ben sarvimer. They must both be. Desire it. Rabbi Yehuda Aimer, Im loy hoyasa imo ruuya la aviv, ain't no nasa bin sarvimara. Rabbi Yehuda says, if the mother wasn't roy la aviv, if this boy's mother is not roy to his father, ain't no nasa bin sarvimara, he cannot be a bin sarvimara. What's roy la aviv? Samishna. So the Gemara is mavair what exactly it means. By the way, don't lose me here. We're going to bring this down to our lives. Practical. And you'll see that how profound and insightful the Torah is in teaching us parenting. So the Gemara wants to ask, what does it mean that the mother is not roi? If she's not roi to the father, Eino Nasa ben Sorevamur. It cannot be ben Sorevamur. My Eino Roya. What does it mean she's not roi? So the Gemara says, have a minute. Ilema. If you want to say it was a marriage that shouldn't have been, they shouldn't have been able to get married, that's not the case. Because the, the Torah says it's his father and his mother. So we don't care 
whether they should have or shouldn't have got married. It's a father and a mother. So what does it mean they're not roy for each other? So says the Gemara, Ela b'shavil aviv. She has to be equal to his father, Ka'ama. Tanya na mehachir b'yehuda aimeh. Rabbi Huda supports this. Listen to this. Im lo hayesa imo shavil aviv. If his mother, this boy, his mother is not shave, which loosely translates as equal to his father, then Eino Nasa ben Sarevamoya. Then he cannot be a ben Sarevamoya. And how should he be, she, she be shave? In what way is she shave equal? Says the Gemara, Bukol ubamara ubakoima. Voice, looks, and height. A strange, a strange should be what it means. What is she looks the same? We'll, we'll come and see what it's talking about. And if she's not, if she doesn't look like him, the same voice and the same height, my time Because the Pasuk says he didn't listen to our voice. It has to be the same voice. And Rashi says it says Kolenu. It doesn't say Kolo Seinu our voices it says in the posse kolenu our voice one voice so shave so you know here that it has to be a kol ba'in and shave the kol has to be the same voice father and mother are both saying the same voice from here we know we know that she has to look like him and that she has to be the same height as him if you're confused don't be surprised it's confusing, but we're going to take something. Last piece, Kaman. Kaman oz lahod tani ben sirma lahoyu velasidlios. Now we've got a maimra. There never was one. There never will be one. There never was a ben sirva maira, and the Gemara says, and there never will be one. Who is the Tana who says this? A nicht over droish droish kabbalshan. The only reason we find it in the Torah is you should learn it to get schar for limud Torah which itself is a strange thing. Kareb Yehuda. It goes according to Kareb Yehuda. There's a name, it may be Rabbi Shimon. Okay, so let's summarize what we've said here. We've got three kashas that I want to ask on this Gemara, this Mishnah, and then we're going to try and tie it in to extrapolate something I believe is crucial, a Musa Haskel, and crucial, painful. So first we got like this. The Gemara says, There never was a Ben Sur of a, a rebellious child and never will be one. How could the Gemara know there'll never be one? There's another Mamra that someone, one of the Tanoim said, I sat on the kever of one. Okay, we'll leave that Tana out. Abulamaisa, how could you say there never be one? Maybe punk there'll be one. Some point in history it'll be a father, mother, the same marakoim, kol maravakoim, they'll look the same, sound the same, maybe. You could say Lahoya there wasn't one. How can you say Lo Osilias? There'll never be one. That's the first kasha. Number two. What difference on earth could it make to the halacha of a rebellious child whether the parents look the same, at the same height, and their voices sound the same. Like, Manaf Kamina. Like, what's it telling us? And it's strange, because what man and woman have a same sounding voice? A woman's voice is generally, you know, a, a softer, lighter, I don't know, sweeter, I don't know what it is, but it's just nicer. You know, men, we're gruffer and tougher, I don't know, we're lower, the women's voices are higher. Like, a woman's voice and a man's voice be the same? Mara? They're going to look the same? It doesn't make any sense. What well, man or woman look the same? And they should be the same height. All right, maybe, could be. That could be. They could be the same height. Kol mara v'koyma. And unless the kol mara v'koyma are the same, they can be. What on earth is the Gemara talking about? And then you have the biggest problem, I think, is that the whole... This whole Gemara tells us then, so if there wasn't one and there never will be one, so why do we learn it? What are we learning a sugya? What's the Torah telling us a sugya that never was and never will be? Torah doesn't waste time. 
So emphasis the Gemara, drosh for kabbal schar. You'll learn it and you'll get schar for limud Torah. Thank you very much. I'm still not bucky in Hilcha Shabbos. You know, leave me alone. You know, let me work on kashras. I got a lot of areas I'm not very good at. And I should go and learn the sugya of this to get schar for Talmud Torah as if I've got nothing better to do in my life. I'd rather take the schar for Hilcha Shabbos, mukza. Let me get mukza claw. It doesn't make sense. Drosh for kabbal schar. What is it talking about? So you have these kashas that on the Gemara, the Mishnah, that make no sense, and yet the Torah is talking to us, and it's timeless, and it's telling us something about parenting that is so beyond profound, and a shtikl pachat. And I'd like to share that out for you, if I can, in these very few minutes. I once gave a lecture, many, many years ago. I, if I remember correctly, someone asked me to speak somewhere about communication. The subject was communication. So I came to give the lecture. I thought it'd be a cute way to start. It was a big packed crowd. So I went over to the microphone and I stood there and I stared. Anyone feeling uncomfortable yet? <laughs> I did it for 30 seconds. It was unbearable. I must tell you, Inside, my kishkas were like, it was unbearable. But for 30 seconds, I stood there until I heard mumblings, laughter, concern, get him some water, you know, what, like, what's going on? And then I asked the following question, or both sides. What? Tell, just hands up. Don't spare me. I got pretty good self-esteem. I'm pretty good. Tell me what you think was going on these last 30 seconds. So of course, on the men's side, someone called out, you brought the wrong notes. <laughs> okay, good, very good, what else? You're nervous, okay, good, what else? It was amazing, Rabbi said it was amazing how when I asked for feedback, there must have been 15, 20 different sparrows of what was going on with me, and, and no one got it right. That was most fascinating. But there were 15, 20 sparrows of what was happening when all I did was stand there and do nothing. You see, what was I doing? What, I, just in case you're interested, what I was actually doing was trying to introduce a sugya called meta-communication. Meta-communication. Clearly, doing nothing, standing still, and staring into the video camera that was videoing me, 15, at least 15 different people learnt a sparrow of what was going on with me based on me doing nothing. There's a sugya called meta-communication. Meta means everything above and beyond the precise words you just said. The words you say is communication. You communicate, you say that, I'm saying words to you. You're hearing, I hope, they're intelligent, and you, 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 you process, and there's seichel to it, and you think about what I'm saying. But beyond the words that are being said, for example, when I do this, right, that like, I hope, gives like, you know, makes it like sound more important, I guess, like, gives chashivas, right? You know why they invented reading glasses? So you could take them off and wave them. And then that's really important. Right? The meta communication is everything you do that's beyond the words, the smile, the angry look, the frustrated look, your body language, your tone of voice, everything in the way you act and behave communicates. You cannot, in fact, one big chacham I once learned from, rather a guy, but he said a good vote, and his vote was you cannot not communicate. You cannot not communicate. Try sitting with your spouse in a room for more than 20 minutes and saying nothing. Try eating supper together and don't talk. Like, just don't say anything and see what happens. Why are you upset with me? What did I do? I didn't mean it. No. And you start like, all your insecurities start pouring out. You know, you got tightness on me. I said last week and I didn't mean it. 
you're just quiet thinking, daydreaming. Oh, but no, if you're not, sit in a car, go drive somewhere together and don't talk. And see how long you last before someone gets nervous. You cannot not communicate. In fact, we spend our lives communicating and we are usually, unfortunately, and somewhat tragically unaware of what is it exactly we are actually communicating. And I'll show you how teeth it goes. It's amazing. You could say the words, I love you. You go to court, the, you know, the, the judge asks, did you say you love? Yes, I said I love you. Now watch this. You tell me if I love you. Ready? I love you. <laughs> yeah, I love you. Okay, I love you. I said it, all right? I said the words, right? You know I love you, right? I said it. Oh, but I did say the words. I said the words. I love you. Oh, but mitaych, and around, the meta means beyond. The words themselves only have meaning in context. So we say things, and then someone says, but I said this, and they said, you never said it. In my office, it's how two people, husband and wife, will come in and they swear to me what happened in their kitchen and who said what and what went on. They said, never happened. I know what you're talking about. I never said it. Never said such a thing. And they said, oh, I wish there was a videotape. And they say, you want the videotape? I want the videotape. I'm telling you, I never said it. What is she really saying? Of course you said the words. But the package, I said, you know, she said, will you change the light bulbs? I said, yeah, I'll change the light bulbs. What does that mean, most men? Yeah, I'll change the light bulbs. It means, I don't know if I'll change the light bulbs. I'll see if I'll change the light bulbs. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure yet. The words were, I changed the light, yeah, I'll change the light bulbs. Most women finally harp that what that means nothing. She goes and changes it herself. Meta-communication is everything other than what you're saying. And actually, what's amazing about it is that the communication that's beyond the words is covea what the words mean. The words themselves actually only have a meaning in context. And the actual words change dependent on how you express them. So you could say, I love you, where I love you. And you know I love you, and you know it's meant. And you say, I love you? Yeah, I love you. Okay, I love you. Fine, that's it. And then she goes off crying, and you wonder why. This sugya we're going to talk about is about how mixed messages occur. The mixed messages where you think you said one thing, and in fact, you said something else. And then you wonder, like, you, what happened with your kid? Because your kid grew up never sure of what you heard, of what you meant, rather. And by the way, they know what they want to hear. They know what they want to hear. So if he says, can I, you know, Ta, can I go? I just want to run to the store. And you say, eh, better not. He's out the door. Because better not wasn't definitively no. Ta, he didn't say no. You said, better not. So you gave it over to me. And he's all mad, fuming. He went to the store. I told him, better not. And yet, that's what he heard. He heard, if you want to go, I'd rather you don't. But you can go. I'm not going to stop you. The package around the message is always d defines what the message actually means. And in parenting, it's so crucial. And particularly, by the way, I, I can't do it now, but I'd love to make a real analysis, in my humble opinion, for the Anglo-Israeli Oilam about how what happens when our children here, or rather your children, mine grew up in Chutzlois, they came afterwards, but the children who grew up here Israeli with Chutzlois' parents Imagine, in my humble opinion, where they miss and different and hear different nuances in what we're saying and meaning because it's all culturally biased. What American means and what he thinks he means when he says something 
whether it's in Hebrew or in English, is, is hard enough if your kids grew up with you in the same country, with the same culture, the same you know, environment, you're still going to mess it up. Uh, what's the chances with a different language? I'd love to make an analysis of it. La Niestati, I think we'd all be shocked if we would like get the list. So, you know, parents said this, what did you hear? I think we'd all be flabbergasted. And that we're not talking about rebellious kids. We're talking about just regular kids. It's partially, it's partially, it has to be that way. If we know it occurs constantly in the same language, if, imagine a foreign culture and language. They grew up in the foreign culture schools with a foreign system and the foreign language and the nuances in Ivrit, which are so different to the nuances in English. It, it's it's pachadik. There are different types of mixed messages. Let's do the ones, the easy ones first. The, um, what time do I have to finish, by the way? 3.45? Okay. The, let's do the very easy ones first. The passive, what I call the passive mixed messages, as opposed to the active mixed messages. What's the passive ones? The passive ones are things like, let's take some really easy ones, like learning. Right? What's a passive mixed message by learning? Is where we are stuck on top of our kids to make sure they're learning, you know, and they go to their seat and they get to yeshiva on time. And we ourselves have already kind of let it go, where we're busy with panasa and we're busy with whatever we're doing, and we're simply not learning very much anymore. Do you see the mixed message? If a child is, not, is hearing, but not seeing, so what does that mean to a child? Where you get, and worse still, if you get angry with him, about Bittles man or Bittle Taylor, where he himself sees you reading all sorts of magazinum and doing all sorts of other things and phone calls and who knows what you're else doing, but not the starkite with learning that we had in the days in Yeshiva. And then he sees us that way. What does that mean? What kind of mixed, me what are we actually saying to, so there we are getting all frustrated and upset and angry about his learning and his shtarkite, where, does he see a dogma of that? Does he see a commitment to that? That's a passive mixed message. You're not telling it to him openly, and about you hold of it. Oh, but does he see it? Does he feel it? Does he experience it? If he doesn't see a genuine sincerity and kvias, well then, what does it mean when we tell it to him? It's half-hearted, it's not real. Because it's not really the core values. Benching, benching is a classic, by the way. We're both say, benching, there's no better dogma for the classic confusion of mixed messages than benching. Here's what goes on in most homes. You know, you've got little kids around the table, it comes to benching, and you start benching, right? So you start benching, Okay, no, 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 no. Like, what is that? I heard from an odd and goddle once, who once told me, I hadn't got his to say, but he said that you should never, ever do that, ever. Just bench like a malach. Just take a bencher mother and father and bench like a malach. All this new newing stuff where you're sacrificing your benching, what exactly are you telling him about the chashivas of benching when your entire benching apparently has new new written into it <laughs> all the way through? What are you telling him? Or her? And you interrupt, you hold vega, you know, there's a loch in You're not meant to hold a child, a baby. I, I cannot know no one on earth who keeps this. The halacha says you're not actually allowed to hold a baby while you're benching. Because it will disturb you from your bench, it will distract your attention. All this new knowing stuff and forcing them. So bench, you want to bench them, bench afterwards. I will show them a dogma, it's a mixed message. It's a passive mixed message where Avada we should bench, but benching is not to be taken very seriously. How about giving stalker? I had this one many times over the years where kids would tell me, you know, we talked about these kind of discrepancies, shall we call them. And they would say how 
you know, where my father would give a gewaldige drasha on the parasha about stocker and hilcha stocker and giving stocker and stocker matzim and mavis and blah, 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 blah. And then the mishalach comes to the door and he says, shh, everyone quiet, shh. Mixed messages. Or, the, or he sees a frustration when the mishalachim come. If you've got no money and you don't have much to give, you give what you got. If you don't have, give them a smile, give them a handshake, give them a cup of water. I would give them warmth, give them kind of, let the child see that it's chashuv to you. Masha'en came, the, the nervous tension, another mashalach, that's the seventh one tonight. And the complaining that goes with it, it's mixed messages. What are we doing? What are we telling? God? Again, I'm telling you, like with the I love you mashal, that the meta communication, the package around it, if it's contradictory to the words you say, the package is always covea. The child, the person believes the package, not the words. That's what we take seriously. How about this one? Talking, simply talking patiently and kindly to your spouse. Having a home where when whatever you discuss is always patient and kind. Soft, it may be a hard subject. I'm not about disagreeing. I'm not getting there yet. I'm simply talking about talking. About where the yachas is one of covered respect and yira as if you're talking to an Adam Chashev. See, then we have the kids who grow up where unfortunately we slip up with this and the tensions and nervousness of life get in the way and we get nervous and it's late and we got to get the kids off to go, where's the coats and where's the, and where's the backpack and no, no, there's only one shoe. Where's the other shoe? What's going on with the shoe? What, he didn't find the shoe, he didn't put his shoe out. Like, and, and before you know it, there's this like examination of the flaws in our whole life and Johan Hogger and, and then we're surprised when the kids come home, the chutzpahdik. And then you get a question on a panel, your deedim covers, how do I deal with your chutzpahdik kids? How do I do chutzpahdik? They're chutzpahdik. We're perfect, but they're chutzpahdik. It's a mixed message. It's like foundation, you say it how you say this, that we talk to each other with kindness, with sensitivity. And we work on it. We do the best we can to try to be respectful and talk so that then our kids will grow up in a dogma where that's the message they got. This is the way you're naig. We don't, you know, so by us, most of us, it's unfortunately drushes. We're so good at dashing. We're much gewaldig when it comes to drushes about doing the right thing, as opposed to actually doing it. It's a mixed message. How about being on time? I don't know what happened to chasnas, but it's fascinating. You know, they make the joke about, you know, bidiyuk. Biz the yidden kumen, you know, until everyone comes, come on time, biz the yidden kumen. You know, it's like, what is it? You go, I, I finished a cycle of daf yemi by going to Chasnas on time. There was no one there to bother me. It was mamish gewaldic. When there was a Chasna, I went on time, took my Gemara, no one there bothering me. Like, what is that? Respect for people's time. And we're like that. It's all this schwachkeit. So what do we expect that our kids then copy that? Or they learn for us that we're makbid, a time is a time, and we respect people's time, it's dignified, it's not, and it's undignified not to. These are passive mis mixed messages that imbue our lives, and similarly, when, you know, something happens, a rav gives a psak, you know, and you don't happen to like that psak, you know, so, really? That's all it takes, really? Sikur and nine, we say al-chet on that. And Yom Kippur, sicker in line. Really? You know, it doesn't take much. They get a Pasha sheet, comes home. This is the biggest Yet Sahara of all of us when the Pasha sheet has spelling mistakes. It would be lovely if it didn't. Oh, but they do. I don't know. Maybe they're under pressure. I don't know what it is. Do we really have to make fun of the spelling mistakes? Like, what is that? So whoever it was, they're probably Anglo-Israeli and they don't know either language probably. Who knows, you know, what it is. But they mean well. But no, that's not the time at the table. So, oh, look, I'm not doing this Pasha sheet. No. <laughs> Don't they know how to spell? Mommy with one mem? 
I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> no, but we do this stuff without thinking. It became part of our like, life without thinking. These are passive mixed messages, and they come out of us, and guess what? Our kids grow up and magnify them because we taught them that that's okay. We taught them that's acceptable. Kal v'chaimah ben b'noishel kal to the active mixed message. And the active as opposed to the passive, that's horrendous. The active is where we actually fight with each other and argue and debate each other like unpleasantly in front of the kids. Where husband, the kids are witness. See, I'm not saying husbands and wives will always agree. As a matter of fact, it is posh, you say the sticker and true, and I found a maharal that says it, that men and women get married and do not get along naturally. It's ultivi. I once gave a drosh and Lakewood on this subject. Mashkiach was masking to me. I could say it publicly, and I did. And everyone was relieved, finally. <laughs> we do not get along naturally. It's TV. Oh, but the, you know why? Because then we work on that shlemus to get along naturally and bring children up in a home where they recognize that different kaychas, different neshamas, different needs, different values can work out how to be respectful to each other. They watch that and witness that. Sure, we're meant to disagree, of course, with respect and covered and kindness and sensitivity and willingness to be mavata, willingness to hear another person. Mavata we are. Imagine what the mixed message is. And, and no surprise when I hear people come for a consultation and, and the kids, they always, they scream at us. They mamish scream at us. And very gently and respectfully, I sometimes, you know, I'll ask like, do you ever scream at each other in front of the kids? Does that ever happen? Yeah. So good. It's your Baruch Shem. Your kids have got good chinuch. They follow you. <laughs> they mamish like they followed you. They're following your footsteps. What's the problem here? Beautiful. The, the active mix, mix message is much more. The active one, like, like a kid says, like I gave before the marshal, the kid wants to go out to the store. It's late at night. They want to go. And you tell the kid, no, 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 no. No, 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 don't go, don't go. I, I don't think you should go. What exactly did he say? Should I do that again? No, 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 uh, uh, no, 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 no. I, I, really think, I, I really think you shouldn't go. Did he say you shouldn't go? What did he say? And then the kid goes and there's an explosion. I told you not to go. The active mixed messages where you don't give clarity, you have to be clear. And if you don't know, by the way, we don't know most of the time. We're clueless. We're just so caught up in like, if I say no, he's going off the derech. And if I say, you know, if I say yes, then maybe he'll love me today and he'll go off the derech tomorrow. Okay, fine, let's, let's get another day of Talmud Torah. Like, like, like we're all so terrified. So we taka don't know. We're posh up, frightened out of our wits, all of us. So we talk a don't know, and we end up giving a mixed message, and then we get mad with them. You know, it's perfectly fine to say, I'm not sure, come back in five minutes. Come back in five minutes. I'll tell you in five minutes. And then, by the way, it's good chinuch, when they say, no, but I need to know now. You say, okay, the answer is no. It's a clear no. If there's any other possible alternative answer, that'll be when you leave the room and come back in five minutes. It may still be no. It may still be no. But if you force me, it's no. Did I do that? Oh, and my kids are all here. I'm like nervous like crazy. <laughs> what are they thinking? And apparently they're nodding, so I'm okay. Phew. So the active, disrespecting, chas for shalom, disrespecting a husband and wife to each other in front of the kids. That's the active mix, mix message. And if you don't know what to say, say, I don't know. I don't know, I need to think about it. Come back to me. Five minutes, ten minutes, tomorrow, whatever it is. Speak to your spouse, work it through, come with an answer. But whatever you do, don't do the I don't think so, it's probably better not to, I, uh, I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Okay, you can go. <laughs> now what? What kind of chinuch is that? And worse still, when you're halfway through the I'm not sure, and they start screaming, you say, fine, go. I mean, it's even worse. That's the last category. We've got the passive and the active. And the last one is the empowering mixed message, 
where you empower your kids to realize they're stronger than you. Because you start telling them what you hold, and they start whining or butchering or threatening or whatever they do. Kids, you know, as long as they cycle through all the possibilities, you're doing good, by the way. If, if your kids do the same thing all the time, you're in trouble. Because they obviously worked out how to play you. But if they cycle, you know, they'll do the plea, oh, mommy, I really love you, and if you let me go, I'll do all the dishes the whole week, and I'll mommy do the laundry and everything, I'll do everything. Am I going? Okay, good. Right. So I'm not in the mood for the laundry. Yeah. But if they cycle, the next one is, I hate you. I hate you. You know how much I hate you? Because you want to I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> and then that didn't work. They say, fine, I'm not talking to you. Not talking to you? If I can't go, I'm not talking to you. The rest of my life, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> right? And then I'm going to hurt your uncle if you don't let me go. <laughs> as long as they're cycling, that means they're looking for another mahalach, you're winning. Like, just don't high-five your spouse till they're out the room. Like, hang in there. You want them to cycle. They're always looking, but if they've got one and it works, you're in trouble. They got your number. The worst thing is to empower your kids. You know, the, the, the kids, you know, in America, we used to have these box drinks. They have, what do they have in this? What do they call them here? There must be, a, what do they say, box drinks in here? Does everyone know what box drinks are? You know, a box with a drink. You put a straw in and drink it. Box drinks. What are they, what are they called here? Choco? I don't Trop know. Tropit? Tropit? Okay, fine. Every country has their own, you know. Everyone knows what box drinks are. I say the box drinks, for some reason, there must be, it's like an isodoraisa to eat it in the house. They're only for out of the house, on a trip, going to school, but you can't eat it, you can't drink one in the house. You know, there's an Issa de Reisa, Sophic de Rabon, and it could be, I don't know, whatever it is. So you come downstairs, and this kid, as you walk into the kitchen, goes like this, right? And you say, what's behind your back? And they say, nothing, nothing. The kid's four. <laughs> nothing, nothing. You say, what's behind your back? Nothing, nothing. Turn around. <laughs> anyway, you go over... You've got a box drink! You took a box drink! Young girl, come down! Chaim took a box drink! Ah! What did we do? He took a box drink! What are we doing? We're empowering our children. When you call in reinforcements over a box drink, you pretty much finished your tenure as a parent. You're done. I mean, if you think your, pa your kids going to have any respect for you ever again, if you need reinforcements for a box drink, yeah, I can't, he's like a box drink again, I can't, I can't, don't buy the box, I told you not to buy, they're over on the other thing, the active mix method, I told you not to buy the box drinks, why are you buying the box drinks? A box drink? We empower our children. Children love secondary gains. There is nothing more fabulous to a child to feel powerful. They realize they don't have the keys, they don't have the credit card, they don't have money. So what do they have to feel powerful? They want to feel powerful. They have making you feel small. Because you're powerful, because you've got keys and credit cards and money. So you must be powerful in the kid's eyes, right? So when they can make you cry, but they can make you beg for reinforcements where they can hold you hostage over a box drink. They must be pretty powerful at four years old. Oh, I'm a knacker. We have to be clear. What are we saying to our kids with authority, with dignity, with clarity? And if you're not sure, put it off till later. Chinuch. The asad, hayasodus of what we do in our homes is to give clarity to our children. Piruvi Rivya is a relatively easy chalik of the mitzvah. The hard chalik of the same mitzvah. Look in Shulchanach, look at the nice chalik. Is Yeshevis Yitzara to bring up a citizen to live in this world in a healthy way. That's the hard part. And to do that properly, we have to give clear messages to our children. We have to give them a clear, honest message about life. What's good, what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. 
and failing to do that, they find the flaws, they find the weaknesses, they find the confusion, and they come out confused. So the Torah teaches us this fantastic sugya of Ben Sawyer of Amor to teach us this. Listen to this. The Gemara said that it cannot be, a rebellious child cannot be a Ben Sawyer of Amor unless the father and mother are the same in Kol Mara Vakoima. So I want to tell you what I think it means. It does not mean Kol does not mean their voice. A man's voice is deep. A lady's voice is light, is higher. Kol means the same voice. We're giving the same message. Mara is facial expression. Koima is body language. It's the same facial expression, body language, and tone of voice. The meta communication has to be the same. And if it's not the same, Ainu Nasa bin Sorovamur. You know why? Because it's not his fault. Because it's not his fault. It's our fault. Because we didn't give proper messages to our kid. And listen to the Kiddush of the Gemara. It's Niflabiosa. Omri Bihuda, La Hoya Balasilias. Guess what? You can't do it. It's not doable. No husband and wife could ever get their kids every single message you ever gave to your kid was exactly the same kol maravakoma tone of voice facial expression body language on every single thing was the same impossible and from this Rabbi Yehud is medayik lo hoya velocity leo so it'll never be so Taka, why do we learn it so I found a fantastic inference in a mashor. I can't say it's the mashor. It's an inference in a mashor. Where the mashor answers and says, you know what, drosh will kabbal schar. It's not Talmud Torah. We've got a lot of other things to learn. But if you drosh, if you learn this sugi of mixed messages, and you understand the chayv kadosh on husband and wife to work out how to try with every ounce of ishtadlis to give our kids the same messages, Kol Maravakoima, tone of voice, facial expression, body language is consistent with the words that we say. If we work hard at it, then Kabul Schaz of the Mashor of Bonim Toivim. The Schaz is not Talmud Torah. It's the Schaz of Bonim Toivim. Rabbi Sai Echald, if we would do this and work stark on this, we would alleviate a million of the problems we face. As all the Ebish we would be Zeicha to Bonim Toivim. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.